Okay, we're going to get going. Thanks so much for joining another SDEC session. My name is Adam Greco, and I will be working behind the scenes to moderate and answer questions um, as the presentation goes through. Today, uh, we're going to be talking about automated data layer validation, and we have Stu Schilling here. So I'm going to just go through a couple housekeeping slides and then hand it over to Stu. So for those of you who are new to the SDEC, maybe you haven't joined a session before, or maybe someone forwarded you this link. Um, the SDEC is a free educational community hosted by Search Discovery around 12 topics uh, for digital analytics. If you sign up, you can choose which of the topics you'd like to be invited to webinars for. And we generally have either one or two webinars a week. Um, if you are listening to this and you are not yet in the SDEC, you have two choices. You can email at sdec at searchdiscovery.com. Or if you look in the chat, associated with the Zoom, um, I went ahead and put a hyperlink in there, a, sh a link, shortcut link to the sign up form. So uh, it's free, we're not going to spam you with marketing. And if you sign up, that allows us to know which topics that you want to be invited to webinars for. So we're at uh, about 3,300 members now and uh, can take as many as we want. So um, go ahead and join if you are not already a member. Uh, next slide. Um, one thing I will ask of you, uh, we don't know why this is the case, but so far we have about 70% of the people who are in the SDEC um, in the Slack group, but we're missing um, a good 30% of you. And that means that 30% of you are not able to view all of the past recordings. And it sounds crazy, but we already have 36 free webinar recordings in the Slack group. And you can't communicate with other SDEC members. And we even have a job channel if you want to uh, hire people or look for a new job. So if you are in the the group, uh, you don't have to reapply to get into the Slack group, uh, but if you're already getting the meeting invites, but you're not in the Slack group, just send me an email at sdec at searchdiscovery.com. I'll send you a link. It takes under 30 seconds to join the Slack group, and uh, there's it's a really easy way for us to communicate with you, and it also helps if for some reason you change jobs and we can't get your email. Um, and then lastly, last slide, um, during the presentation today, if you have any technical questions, please put that in the chat, um, or if you just need to chat with me about something, um, I will be on that. But if you have questions for Stu that uh, you want him to answer at the end of his talk, please use the Zoom Q&A area. Uh, that's going to be the best area for us to find the questions. Uh, but again, anytime you have any questions or if you've signed up for certain topics and you're getting too many emails, whatever you need, just send an email to sdec at searchdiscovery.com and we'll take, that, take care of that for you. So with that, I'll hand it off to Stu. Thanks, Adam. Um, today, what we're going to be talking about is uh, automated data layer validation. Um, using the uh, Search Discovery Data Layer Manager launch extension, as well as JSON schema. And that's a lot of words. So uh, we're going to start with just some basics and some best practices. And uh, the things that we'll be talking about pretty much adhere to these best practices. And so I'm almost at this point uh, viewing these things as axiomatic and not best practices, but one, when you are implementing a uh, new site or uh, moving technology and you have the chance to do some refactoring of the way that you're doing tagging, um, use an event-driven data layer. And uh, there's lots of uh, information out there, uh, blog posts, and um, that's kind of the, the new buzzword, if you haven't heard it, event-driven data layer or EDDL is uh, is what you'll see out there. Uh, secondly, adopt a data layer manager to make implementation a breeze. And uh, we have an extension for launch called data layer manager. Um, it is kind of a uh, class of its own as far as what it does, uh, but um, there are existing data layer managers out there and uh, for GA and GTM, GTM is actually a data layer manager of sorts. Um, and there are other extensions out there that are on the market, but uh, 
data manager, our extension has been out there for over two years now, it is in uh, hundreds of production implementations and uh, is serving a wide audience very well. So uh, that's what we're gonna be talking about. Uh, and then three, and this is kind of the point of this uh, presentation, validate every data layer event every time. And uh, that's where we kind of differentiate with Data Layer Manager and uh, the processes that we'll be talking about. So, EDDL basics. Um, what is an event-driven data layer? So you guys have probably heard the term and you're probably like, that's just another buzzword. I don't really have a picture of what that is in my mind. Um, so EDDL is a JavaScript array of JSON event objects. And that's maybe a, a lot to take in. Uh, and you're probably like, great, what's that look like? And I'm gonna be a little bit uh, uh, <laughs> of a uh, smart ass and just say, it looks like this. So uh, this, these, these brackets, square brackets, indicate a JavaScript array. And so an array is a number of things. Uh, and these uh, curly brackets indicate JSON objects or JavaScript objects to be precise. And dot 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 means that, hey, there's, there's some stuff that is within each of these objects. And this will uh, reveal itself a little bit better on this next slide. So how do event objects end up on the event-driven data layer? And uh, this is my statement. So event objects are added to the event-driven data layer using the push method. And it is typically the responsibility of the application to do these pushes. So in a little more concrete terms, we want to know about certain things as they happen within the application so that the tag manager can do smart things like send beacons to Adobe Analytics or send third-party tags out to Facebook or Critio or whatever third-party marketing technology you're working with. Um, so here's an example of an event object, which is curly brace, curly brace, being pushed onto our data layer. So our data layer in this case is this array exposed at window scope. We're calling it app event data. We're pushing this event object. And this event object is telling us that a page load has started and we have some contacts or a payload that is accompanied. So page.page .page name and page.page .page category. And in this case, it's the careers homepage on the careers section of our website. So now what happens when an event object is pushed onto an event-driven data layer. Uh, I'm gonna go down here first. So without a data layer manager, not much happens at all. So we're just pushing that object onto an array. And from the you know, native, like native browser functionality, it doesn't care. It's just an array out there that happens to have an object. But with a data layer manager, when you do a push, it is going to uh, expose that event into launch. So we can trigger launch rules. So we'll have the ability to say, I'm going to create a launch rule and I want this rule to trigger when a certain event is pushed. So we'll create a launch rule for page load started. We'll create a launch rule for product added to cart, a launch rule for any of these events that uh, would happen on your website. And then um, also the data layer manager extension, it uh, exposes the key value pairs on the event object so that you can create launch data elements from them. So you're, you have easy reference to the information like page.paging or page.page .page category. So, uh, okay, show me, um, I'm just gonna jump out where were we? We were right there. All right, so I'm gonna jump out 
into uh, a browser here and I will show you. So this is a, uh, a website that I use for all sorts of demos. Um, it has launch embedded on it. Um, it has a launch property here, which uh, has a bunch of rules, a bunch of data elements, and the extensions that I have installed are the core extension, of course, data layer manager, uh, and Adobe Analytics and Product Stream Builder. And so I'm going to show you first that little example of a page load started push. And I'm going to just copy this piece of code and come over here into the console. And so this bit of code bar app event, app event data equals window dot app event data or an empty array. So this establishes um, that I'm using an existing variable if it exists or establishing a new one. And then I'm going to push this event object with an event name page load started and then this information onto the data layer. And what you'll notice right away here is that when I did that, because I have data layer manager in place, we see rule page load started fired. And the connection to that is here. So we're going to look at this rule page load started. And the event that triggers this rule is a data layer manager, data layer push event, and the event type is specified here as page load started. So this is aligning directly with this right here. And then also we see Adobe Analytics set variables on tracker. And uh, if we look at, uh, let's just do an S.T and we'll send it off. Um, so uh, here's our page name that came from here. And here's our site section that came from here. And uh, a few other things that are set on that beacon. And we see that here within this rule, page load started, cancel, discard. And all this rule does is set some variables. And here we're setting EVARs, one, two, three, four, EVAR 30, with these data elements, um, which are references to the uh, either the information in the data layer or some other information like the query string or the path name or the URL, which we don't have to provide um, in a data layer. So that gives you a quick uh, feeling for the triggering. So we push and a rule is triggered. We push and a rule is triggered. We push and a rule is triggered. Um, the application would be responsible for doing this work. I'm going to jump back here. Uh, nope, here. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is event objects and JSON schema. So you probably have heard of JSON, uh, JavaScript object notation, uh, but you might not have heard of JSON schema. So I'm going to give you a little taste of that. Um, how does JSON schema relate to an event object? So a specific event object will be represented as JSON, but JSON schema can be used to describe the structure of that event object. And here is an example of that. So here is an event object that we've talked about, and we I was pushing this event object uh, multiple times to the data layer, but um, this is JSON schema that describes this event object. So this thing we might see with different page names and different page categories in different instances, and that's what you would expect. If you're on the careers page, you'd expect it to say careers home. If you were on a uh, job application, you'd expect it to say job application. This is a technical, so here's the JSON schema on the, the right side. 
this is a technical representation of the structure of this. And so we can read this and say, all right, here's my schema. And what do I require in the schema? We require a page up, a page node. So let's describe that page node properties page. It's a type object and it exists at the top level as page. And in this object, we require page name and page category. And page name is described uh, to be under page dot page name and is of type string. Page category is also page page category and it's of type string. So by using this description, we will eventually be able to validate that indeed when this gets pushed, we do have a page node and we do have a page name node. Um, if we don't, then we'll raise an error. And also, if we try to pass page name as something other than a string, then we can also detect that as an issue. Um, so how do we do that? How do we use this JSON schema for EDDL validation? And I'm gonna jump in here and show you that the way that Data Layer Manager does it is that we provide the ability to hold JSON schema for event objects. And I will pop right back into launch here. And we're gonna look at the extensions. We're gonna look at the configuration of Data Layer Manager. And down here, uh, we have this optional event name configuration. And so, um, we can specify these are the events that we're going to use in this application. And the one that we were just looking at was page load started. And if I hadn't done JSON schema before, it would say add JSON schema, but here we're going to click edit JSON schema. And indeed, here's that same thing that we just saw on the slide. Um, the schema that represents what is expected to be passed when a page load started event is pushed. And we have these for all of our different events. So product added to cart, this is what we expect. And for order placed, this is what we expect. And so by using JSON schema, we have essentially just created a rule set for hundreds of different validation scenarios uh, without really writing any code. Um, so let's see this in action. I'm gonna just make sure that I'm sort of uh, in line here. Um, um, yeah, let's, let's talk about this. So Data Layer Manager is going to provide us the ability to do validation um, by environment. So we can say, I want to validate the payloads as they come in in development or in staging or in production or any combination of those environments. And when an exception happens, we have the ability to route that exception to a, an external platform called Airbrick. And all you have to do is put in your connection uh, specs here. And I just made these up, so uh, don't try to use those yourself. Um, and there's a little note in the extension itself that is going to tell you, um, hey, if you're gonna do this, you need to install the Airbrake.js notifier launch extension. And we'll just take a quick look at that. It is this, and there's no configuration that you need to do for this. It's just, you just need to install this extension to provide the plumbing for communication. So, um, with that in mind, and just this last little disclaimer, um, well, before I go here, uh, if you don't have Airbrake, if you've not used Airbrake, it is pretty dirt cheap. Uh, you can start with like $19 a month is gonna get you 25,000 monthly exceptions caught. And uh, that's pretty good value for money. Um, so there's a link here, Airbrake IO, you can just go sign up. There's a 30 day free trial as well. Um, and then the other disclaimer is that the functionality that we're talking about here in Data Layer Manager 
is part of our uh, paid uh, plan on Data Layer Manager. And so in order to use this, you need to go into Data Layer Manager um, and you need to uh, click the little gear up here at the top um, and that gets you to the uh, subscription uh, sign up. And so I think we've covered all the all the legalese here. So we're going to jump into a little bit of a demo. So let's go to a product detail page. And as we do this, you're you're probably seeing a lot of a lot of stuff happening. This is a you know working application. But what we're going to play with here is the the functionality under Add to Cart. And so here I am on this page. If I click Add to Cart, the application itself is going to push and add to cart uh, event. So I'm just going to bring that up. And so this is what the application is going to do. It's going to do uh, you know variables based on the page that we're on, but it's pushing product ID, uh, name for the product, whether it's in stock or out of stock, the brand for the product, the SKU for the product, some selling price information, and the price type, as well as a quantity of you know, how many of these am I adding to the cart. And so when I push this, what we're going to see in the console is, oh, I'm sorry, let me, let me go back and do that again, and I'm going to put preserve log on so we can actually see it. All right, so I pushed a product added to cart data layer uh, object, and we cause a rule to fire, which set some variables. It configured a product string, and then find, finally fired a link track beacon and cleared variables. And we can look at the launch side of this. We'll look at the rule for product added to cart. And again, triggered by added to cart, set some variables. So the variables that we're setting, looks like we're just setting SC add on the events variable. And then product string, so we're setting uh, our product ID and we're setting event five with the quantity added, event six with the selling price, and we're setting some merchandising EVARs on the product string brand, name, SKU, type to EVAR 5, 6, 7, and 8, price type, rather. Um, back over here, uh, we see here's our beacon coming out the other end, and we see SC add, which was from our A set variables, and we see uh, our events. So this is our in stock, out of stock. Uh, this is our, I'm sorry, this is our quantity added. This is our selling price, and then brand and name and SKU and price. And, uh, and that's pretty good. So let's go back to the page and let's pretend that we are the application. So we're, we're gonna push this manually. We're gonna do just what the application was, was doing. And instead of pushing this button, I'm just going to push it onto the data layer. And here we see the same thing. So we push this, we ran through the rule out the other end, we had a beacon flying out to Adobe Analytics. So far, so good. So that's, we haven't talked about validation yet because I've been pushing things that are good. The application's all set up. This uh, object uh, matches our schema. We're we're in great shape, and I can actually tell you here. Let's let's turn on my verbose logging, and here by turning on debug logging, um, we can see Data Layer Manager event validation or event payload validation passed, and this is just an echo of this same event that we pushed before. But we can see that Data Layer Manager uh, has some information or added some information to this event um, that says uh, validation was active, uh, it was validated, and it is valid, and we have no errors. So far, so good. 
So let's come back and let's look at a different scenario. So this was the good cart ad. And I have built up here a, and put this on the right. On the left, I'm gonna bring up the, so here's the good one. Uh, this one is bad. Now, without JSON schema and without data layer manager validation, um, if we were doing data layer QA ourselves, what we would have to do is we would have to look at this thing. Uh, we'd have to look at it here, or we would have to physically come out to our data layer, and we'd have to say, all right, I'm going to look at the data layer. I'm going to look at product added to cart. And uh, yes, it has the event. And yes, it has a product object. And there's one of them. And there's a price object under that price type and selling price. Those look good. Brand looks good. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to say that passed. Uh, that is problematic because, one, I, I, I just honestly, I don't know how you could do that. Uh, without killing yourself after a week. Um, with JSON schema and with data layer manager, I'm gonna push this bad one. And even visually with the help of syntax, you know, uh, context highlighting, you can see that there are some differences between these two things. And you could see that, you know, maybe this product ID, you didn't expect uh, that it's a number instead of being a string. Uh, and maybe a selling price, you know, that's a number instead of a string. But the rest of it, um, you know, you'd have to look pretty hard to figure out what's going on. You can see there's 18 lines here and there's 19 lines here. So there's some difference. And you might come to say, oh, there's skew in the good one and we're missing it here. But at scale, you just can't do it. Um, so here's the bad one. I'm going to push this and we're going to see something quite different. So this is the big difference, and that is that immediately when I push this, we are getting uh, payload validation errors. So these are actual you know, errors in the console, and they you can detect them as such. But um, missing required property SKU, missing required property brand, uh, invalid type number. So invalid type number expected string. So that is on product ID. And that's one that we talked about. So product ID is a number, but we wanted a string here. And invalid type number expected string. And that is on selling price. So that one we kind of predicted. And finally, what is this one? Uh, this one's new. So value zero is less than minimum one. So within our JSON schema, we said that uh, the quantity has to be one or more. And here we've done an add to cart with a quantity zero. So, um, yeah, so all of those errors were caught automatically. Um, they'll be caught every time. And um, we see them in the console. We also are able to see them on the data layer themselves. I'm sorry, <laughs> the data layer itself. So if we open this up, we're going to see that, hey, on these last two add to carts, uh, we can see that if we look at our meta validation result, we'll see that uh, it was not valid. And here are those five errors. But also, each of these five errors would have been sent, if we have error break configured, uh, to error break. And so we have a notification here. We see three new errors, four new occurrences. If we refresh, we see uh, here's our product added to cart, invalid type number, expected string. And we can look at the details of every occurrence of this, and we can see what was actually sent in. We can see the error, and um, we can also see all sorts of technical information that will tell us uh, what type of browser this happened on. So if you're running this in the wild, you can find those uh, sneaky little errors that might happen only on one browser or only on one version of one browser uh, because the application uh, 
implemented the data layer in a way that was not cross-browser compatible. Uh, we can see where it happened. So this was United States and do some geolocation from that. Um, all sorts of great information coming in here. And we can also aggregate to see uh, as we don't have enough of these to aggregate across. Oh. Yeah. Once you get a, a bunch of data, then you can start doing aggregations to see, you know, where is this happening and get down to root cause. Um, I am going to show you just one more thing here um, before we uh, go into questions. And that is, um, you may be looking at this and saying, well, you said that you're gonna do this without code. Uh, and so here's my product added to cart. And uh, how do I get that? How do I get to this level? And how do I learn how to write uh, appropriate JSON schema? Um, so here is just a little, a little trick. So I'm gonna take the good one here and I'm going to copy this object and I'm actually gonna drop off this bit because we really care about the payload. So there is my product added to cart payload. And this is at Liquid Technologies online JSON to schema converter. And so just to get the basics, we can drop in what we think is good. We can say generate schema and it is building out that JSON schema that you can then take and copy and paste right back into uh, into Data Land Manager. And you're kind of off to the races from there. Uh, you might want to modify this slightly if you wanted to uh, add something like on quantity, we have a minimum. So we can add that minimum value in here. Or if you had a, a regex that uh, describes what your product ID looks like. So your product ID starts with two uppercase letters followed by a dash and then, you know, nine, uh, nine or more digits, then you could represent that here and you'd be validating your product ID, not only uh, that it exists, but also that it exists as a string and matches a certain pattern. So, uh, I think we are at time. Um, in this presentation, there's some useful links. Um, one is a link to a tutorial that kind of shows you how to uh, how to build out a uh, some some example events using Data Layer Manager, using Product String Builder, and using Launch. Um, the Data Layer Manager documentation is all out here on techdocs.searchdiscovery.com um, in as much detail as I could imagine to provide. And then uh, uh, JSON schema spec is out here at json-schema.org. And the link to that online builder is also provided here. And with that, I will go to questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Stu. Uh, if anyone has additional questions, I've been answering the ones that I can uh, so far. Uh, go ahead and use the Zoom Q&A and post your questions while we start digging into them. So we've got quite a few from Lucas, though we'll start if we, have, if we don't have enough time, maybe Stu and Lucas can have a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, how about making things reusable? For example, is the definition of a user ID property, is if that's always the same, but should be checked um, on example, 10 different events. How do I make those 10 different events check one generic definition? Um, yeah, so the way that I had put the schema together was in a you know, pretty basic, every schema is, uh, is a schema unto itself. However, JSON schema includes the ability to do schema refs. And so you can do a schema reference. So let's say that you have a product object and that product object is described on one schema. Um, within another schema, you can reference that schema directly. 
Okay, and then another question is, um, are you sure it's preferred to have developers push the data to data layer? Wouldn't this add extra burden on those teams whenever data needs to be modified instead of teams uh, specific to data tracking? I'm not sure if I got that all right, but does that make sense to you, Stu? Um, yeah, yeah. So it's you're, you're really kind of edging up to is it best practice to use a data layer and have the application feed the data layer, or is it uh, is it better to use DOM scraping, uh, use the tag manager to use CSS selectors to find things on the page and just pull the things off the page? Um, the DOM scraping method is quick, but it is fragile, and when we look at the data quality and the number of issues that you end up having to hunt down and having having to resolve when you use the tag manager to scrape things off the page using CSS selectors and the like. Uh, you end up uh, with a with a tagging implementation that is going to break. I mean, it's just you don't know when it's going to break, but it's going to break. And you also have the you don't have the the benefit of validation at what I would call the fountainhead, like the fountainhead being the data layer itself. That's where the data is coming into your application. And if you can catch an issue right there, you're catching it for the myriad downstream destinations where that data goes. So this data layer is feeding not only analytics, but it's feeding, let's say on product added to cart, you're going to have a Facebook pixel. You're going to have possibly a Credio pixel. Um, if you're still using Credio, you're going to have a lot of uh, maybe some uh, you know, GA, GTAG stuff. And you want, in my opinion, you want to catch those issues in one place and you want to provide the information in one place. Okay, cool. Uh, next question is, uh, could this approach be applied to other tag manager platforms like GTM? Um, yes. So GTM is a is an event-driven data layer model. So with GTM, you use, you know, typically the, the convention is data layer with uh, camel case, lowercase d and capital L. And uh, GTM is sitting there and it is watching for you to push things onto that data layer. Um, you can also have launch and data layer manager sitting there uh, potentially for no other reason than to validate what's being pushed onto that data layer. And so uh, you, you essentially have two processes that are going to be notified when you push and um, the validation can can take place in launch and uh, trickle out to airbrake if you choose to do that. Okay, next. Uh, next question. What is or are the differences between using the push method versus a direct call rule? Um, so it used to be a lot. So, uh, it used to be back in the DTM days, uh, a direct call rule was nothing but a trigger. So you could say satellite.track and then give a string, and that string would be used to trigger a rule, uh, a direct call rule. Um, the difference, um, the difference at that point in time was that you couldn't pass a payload on satellite track. Um, and uh, so, so there was big benefit in using what, uh, what we recommended at the time, using browser custom events. So when DTM implemented custom events, you could trigger a rule based on a custom event, pass a payload on that event, and then uh, uh, that payload would be available uh, within the rule to, to do what you need to do. Uh, with direct call rules versus data layer pushes, um, 
direct call rule is still going to be proprietary. Proprietary. So you're going to have to use satellite.track within your application code to trigger into launch. Um, there is, let's say that you had two, uh, let's say you had launch sitting next to GTM, both monitoring the same data layer. Uh, satellite.track is not going to tell GTM what to do. It's GTM will have no idea what's happening there, um, <clears throat> but launch would. So there's that, there's that disparity there. Um, also, if you should, for some reason in the future, decide that you're going to uh, move away from Adobe Launch, um, you would have to go in, you'd have to refactor um, all of those satellite.track uh, calls into something uh, in order to get some other uh, implementation up and going. And so there's a little vendor lock-in using direct call rules. And I would say beside that, there is functionality within uh, Data Layer Manager and other you know, generic Data Layer Managers that do things like uh, provide you computed states of the Data Layer. And so you can do things like push uh, page information and then push product information and then push user information. And after doing all those three things, the data layer will provide you a composite of all those three pushes so that you can bring it together into, say, one beacon that you send off to Adobe Analytics or one, uh, one hit that you send to Google Analytics. Okay, so I know we're almost at our time. Maybe one last question. And we had some folks ask if they could get some of the links that you showed in the slide. So um, I assume, Stu, you can post that into the slide. Um, but uh, one last question. How does Data Layer Manager work together with the new Adobe Client Data Layer Extension? Um, the Adobe Client Data Layer Extension is an homage to Data Layer Manager. Um, it is, I'm, I'm just gonna say it. Um, I think that uh, there were some folks at Adobe that didn't like recommending a product made by another company. And so they, uh, they created the Adobe Client Data Layer extension. It does not have this validation functionality. It does not have a number of other functionalities that's in Data Layer Manager. And uh, you know, the benefit, I guess, of the ACDL extension is that um, it is open source. So if you wanted to contribute to that project, you could. And uh, it, the, the thing that it is trying to do is the same exact thing that Data Layer Manager has been doing successfully for uh, for two years and counting. Um, so I guess that's, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> okay, awesome. Okay, cool. Well, uh, thank you all so much for joining. And Stu, as always, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and tools. So um, thanks for joining us, Stu. You are very welcome. Happy to do it. Everyone have a wonderful day and we will see you at the next SDEC session.